buenas tardes. El rector Carlos Peña, gracias eh, por su amable invitación a esta universidad y poder diri dirigirme a esta distinguida reunión. Estoy encantada de estar aquí en la universidad, en particular gracias a la profesora Cat Collins, directora del Observatorio de la Universidad de Derechos Humanos en el Instituto de Investigación en Ciencias Sociales por la organiz organización de mi, visit mi visita aquí hoy. Le he, le he leído al rector acerca de la universidad y del profundo compromiso de la comunidad de ecopartales para involucrar y orientar la investigación de la universidad y los esfuerzos académicos en el desarrollo social, político, cultural y económico del país y en el desarrollo de vínculos estrechos entre la enseñanza, el personal y los asuntos públicos de Chile y la región. La reciente colaboración de su propio Observatorio de Derechos Humanos con el Centro de Estudios Legales y Sociales de Argentina, por ejemplo, en el desarrollo de normas para la toma de testimonios de las víctimas sobrevivientes de la tortura es un ejemplo de la valiosa labor que emana de esta región, que pueden contribuir a la promoción de las prácticas de derechos humanos a nivel mundial. La, neces la necesidad de nuestras universidades para estimular el cuestionamiento de las normas, su cumplimiento y reivindicación con el, con el desarrollo de la capacidad de crítica el pensamiento creativo y emancipador nunca ha sido más profundo. Quiero expresar una vez más, una vez más, mi más profundo agradecimiento por por haber sido invitado a estar en una comunidad para quienes esta meta es tan trascendente. Rector y amigos, Ireland has a strong historical relationship with many in this region and I'm very happy to be among you today in Santiago de Chile on one of my first overseas visits since my election and inauguration as president of Ireland at the end of last year. I am most grateful to have received from President Piñera a kind invitation to make this visit. I am, of course, proud that Bernardo Higgins, the founding father of the independent Chilean state, was the son of an Irishman, Ambrosio Higgins, whose family came from the west of Ireland. When Ambrosio Higgins left Ireland, left the west of Ireland to work for Lord Bective, he would have been an Irish speaker, speaking the ancient language of Ireland, as I have just said, that language is still there, and I was very proud to have been a member of parliament representing the largest number of Irish speakers. But I moved to recall my visit here in 1988 as a crucial moment for the Chilean people. I was the first international observer to arrive, observer de Runo to the Proceso, and I recall very clearly my experience at the time throughout Chile, from Punta Arena to Santiago and back, and my admiration for the courage and the deep commitment to democracy that the Chilean people had, the people whom I knew and was familiar with, who had in fact of whom the warm hearts of Pablo Neruda and Victor Jara had sung. Chile, Latin America, have an old and complex relationship uh, uh, today with, with Europe. The close cultural and historical ties that bind the European Union today and Latin America are important as relationships now and into the future, as a relationship above all else, a relationship between people. And given the multitude of individual and personal relationships that connect our continents, that have given our friendship a very special meaning, it is no surprise that the European Union is the number one trading partner for Chile and also for Mercosur. 
and as our economies have expanded and developed in recent times, we've been drawn closer in economic, cultural and personal relationships and invited to forge them anew. The economic ties are stronger than ever and are characterized by interdependence through increasing flows of trade and investments in both directions. Latin America is viewed by Europe as a key emerging market with its 575 million population. The region will play a crucial role in the structure of wild trade and all of its consequences. But it is much more than that. It is a continent where the process of change in a multitude of ways, in a multitude of ways, is offering new models of economy and society and their connection of forms of participation, of debate as to the balance between state and society, between state, civil society, and political parties, debate as to what constitutes democracy today, and the institutional balance that will best serve an emancipatory democracy. But I think the political dyna dynamic that is shaping the South American continent is having and will continue to have, I believe, such a result as will need, lead to new thinking in theory and policy. New thinking that will yield a result for humanity, for the future. A result from which not only the peoples of South and Central America will benefit, but we in Europe and the rest of the world will as well. <coughs> All of the benefits that Ireland and Europe have achieved from collaborating in a vision for a Europe at peace, cohesive, and with respect for rights, will no doubt be achieved and surpassed by the regional structures that you have created, are creating, and are developing. For us, the experience of regional integration in Europe has taken a particular form of evolution from free trade through economic, social, and indeed political integration. This ebb and flow has embraced social cohesion and then in turn, in more recent times, the concentration has moved to currency issues provoked by the response of unaccountable markets. The gradual progress through treaty development has been dislodged by international and regional currency and public finance issues. Yet the European project continues to inspire, and not just as an ideal but as a task in progress, as a region of the peoples of Europe at peace, in security, cohesive and competitive, and offering at its best moments, we hope, models of such laws as are socially just and environmentally sustainable. The changes and challenges in Mercosur, in which Chile is an associate member, have had their own evolution from the obvious benefits of trade through social Mercosur to the rich debate on social participation, sustainable economic growth, and reduction of inequalities. The value of the social and productive dimensions of the Mercosur have been noted by regionalism specialist, for example, Jose Briqueño Ruiz, who has written, the social and productive dimension of Mercosur implies a new way of responding to globalization. It is in this environment, and it is in response to that promise, that some of the most valuable discussions and dialogue on the potential of state, civil society, and popular movements are taking place. And we will all have much to learn from it, in my view. My address is taking place, of course, against the background of our global economic crisis. Ireland and a number of European Union member states, in particular, are experiencing deep and sadly sustained recession. Solving this crisis and achieving such an economic stability as will be sustainable and just will require new thinking and innovative models. We cannot, I suggest, simply seek to return to business as usual and revert to approaches that have failed our people and with the consequences of such unacceptable levels of unemployment as affects more than half of our young people in several European countries. The crisis to which I refer in the global financial system is not, of course, just a technical failure or some unexpected quirk of fate. The problem is, as you have said, Rector, an intellectual one. Indeed, a moral. Certain assumptions about economic models 
were allowed to become a single determining hegemonic orthodoxy that went unchallenged, even in the face of empirical evidence, and despite some exceptional warnings that were ignored, warnings that a speculation-based boom led by property values was unsustainable and would inevitably lead to disaster. But the extremist demand of markets without regulation won out. The model of an unregulated banking system was allowed to create a property bubble within an international speculative bubble that had flowed from amendments to the Glass-Steagall Act. It is evidence, thus inescapably, of an ethical problem an aggressively speculative model aimed at maximizing short-term profits that may have indeed been legally compliant, but which was morally blind in its social consequences, was presented as a single hegemonic model of the connection of economy and society. And sadly, I say it indeed as an academic, that model was and is still taught in so many countries to students in introductions to economic theory as the single paradigm of such a connection between economy and society. If we are not to repeat the mistakes of the past, and if we wish to ensure that global economy, that global economy we must now try to build is an alternative, is just and sustainable, then we must encourage such a, a learning culture of real independent thought and critical capacity among academics, policy makers, and across the professions, as we'll ensure that these intellectual and inter ethical dimensions receive adequate attention. It is critical for our shared future that students are in college. And what pleasure it is to me as a former teacher in a university, to be in a university, again, if even for a brief time. It is critical that students are encouraged to think critically, to challenge and to ask the necessary questions so that the professionals of the future do not fall victim to old orthodoxies presented as incontestable truths, even as scientific fact. Our professionals of the future must have the capacity to critically evaluate the integrity and value of the work they do and its consequences, to experience work itself, not merely as the instrument that creates the capacity to consume, but as the experience of the full human development of the unique talented being that has the capacity to live creatively in the naturally accepted dignity of self and others. The extreme neoliberal policy paradigm that was developed by, among others, significant and influential papers from the Chicago School of Economics was neither an accident nor a set of inalienable truths. It was, we must remember, a conscious creation, a conscious assertion and incursion in economic theory, an exercise in intervention in policy formulation and manipulation to achieve particular policy goals to serve particular interests. It was, let us accept, despite the many eminent disclaimers that there are, an ideological enterprise. If we reflect for just a moment or two on how it all came to be, in the wake of the Great Depression, extremists of the laissez-faire tradition might have fallen from favour. However, Friedrich von Hayek wrote to serfdom in 1944, represented a new departure in the interpretation he placed on some fundamental philosophical, even moral concepts, such as freedom. Freedom was to be defined within the project as an economic freedom of the markets, ideally unconstrained by any state regulation. But there is, of course, a considerable distance between the highly formalized formulations of modern classical economics, which at best reach a selected number of areas, and political narratives that seek to translate the loose principles of laissez-faire capitalism and supply-side economics into public policy. Indeed, even from such early writing as that of Eduardo Frey Montalvo, who contributed to the Brandt Report in his day, South America was to become, of course, familiar with the excesses of neoliberalism, and through its influence on, for example, the Washington Consensus, the dominant interpretive framework throughout the region at the end of the 20th century, 
According to Uruguayan political scientist Francisco Penizza, the benefits throughout the region, even early on, of that variant were narrow. Penizza has written, even when relatively more successful in the early and mid-1990s, the Washington consensus over-promised and under-delivered on economic growth, poverty, and inequality. The financial crisis in Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil went on to raise fundamental questions about the reforms demanded by the modernization consensus or other neoliberal initiatives. Neoliberal policies did not, of course, just deliver economic crisis. They had inter alia the consequence of polarizing societies across the region. As Chilean economist Claudio Lomnitz puts it, the neoliberal era produced a deep fracture in every Latin American country between the segments of the population that thrived under free trade and the shrinking state and those that were put at risk. Such economic fractures are often as we know, and this is perhaps the most important warning as to the future, at the root of deeper divisions that may challenge the democratic credentials of representative democracy itself. And these are issues which we in Europe now face as well. We must recognize that it is urgent to identify such models of economy as are appropriate for the 21st century, models with a new global ethic, that is cognizant of and responds to the lessons of the current crisis. We need to ensure, even insist, that the state plays its role again as regulator, innovator, partner, and protector of the greater intergenerational consequences of decisions, of environmental impact, for example, and social justice, that the state is allowed to do so. A world, I suggest, where the state and its political institutions have surrendered or have been stripped of legitimacy by unaccountable markets is not only a vulnerable world, it is a dangerous world. So the world has much to learn from Latin America and from the courage of your own leadership in scholarly terms today. Former President of Brazil, Lula da Silva, gave an illustration of what I am saying with such courage and the need he suggested to break away into new thinking when he addressed the United Nations in 2009 and said, more than a crisis of big banks, this is the crisis of big dogmas. And he went on, I refer to the absurd doctrine that markets could regulate themselves with no need for so-called intrusive state intervention and to the thesis of absolute freedom for financial capital with no rules or transparency beyond the control of peoples and institutions. And as to the future, Latin America, I suggest, is leading the way in advancing a renewed critical evaluation and appreciation of the role of the state and the moral significance of its reassertion and redefinition, if necessary, in its relationship to its citizens. Claudio Lumnitz reflects this when he says, the current rejection of neoliberalism in many Latin American countries does not single a rejection of the market but a repudiation of the ideology that places markets at the center of the development model to the detriment of public institutions and their social context. Latin American economies, many of which have enjoyed high levels of growth since 2008, have of course demonstrated the important role of the state in development, while at the same time facing the challenge of protecting the more vulnerable sectors of the population against economic volatility. Penitza again has written in evaluation of such approaches, there is much to be said for a combination of economic pragmatism and social inclusion. And as to those of us in Europe, there is a correspondence between such a view in with some of the best thinking in Europe. Jürgen Habermas, a European public intellectual who is among those leading a critical discourse in the Northern Hemisphere has written, the whole program of subordinating the life world to the imperatives of the market must be subjected to scrutiny. The agenda which recklessly prioritizes shareholder interests and is indifferent to increasing social inequality, to the emergence of an underclass, to child poverty, of a low-wage sector, and so on, has been discredited 
with its mania for privatisation, this agenda hollows out the core functions of the state. It sells the remnants of a deliberative public sphere to profit-maximising financial investors. And it subordinates culture and education to the interests and moods of sponsors who are dependent in turn on market cycles. <coughs> the solutions then that best offer to assist our shared future must, I believe, reflect our interdependence and must not shrink from addressing the structures that operate at global level, which are currently not assisting and indeed may even be undermining emancipatory and creative thinking. We must be open and courageous in defining and seeking that type of globalised world we wish to pursue. The strategy which will enable us, by working collectively for peace, for an expansion of justice, such a prosperity as allows us across the globe to live in dignity with human rights that are implementable, that is the kind of interdependence we must strive for. We must honestly recognise, however, that so much of the globalisation rhetoric has in fact stifled debate and choked discussion. But neither is it the case that the North-South trade relationship, or indeed the renewed development debate, are throwing up entirely new issues. As to trade, in 1980 the authors of the Brandt Report set out a vision for global development that went well beyond, indeed would contradict, the narrow economic growth objectives that have dominated economic policy these past three decades. The Brandt Report in 1980, in its modest proposal, suggested that the objective of development should be, quote, to lead to the self-fulfillment and creative partnership in the use of a nation's productive forces and its full human potential. The report in its time, a modest and somewhat conservative appeal to all world leaders and people from all backgrounds and nations to participate in the shaping of our common future. Importantly, however, it called for new structures, new power relationships in the international financial institutions to ensure that lesser developed regions and those most vulnerable had a stronger voice in the development of policy frameworks which would in turn protect their economies, their environment, their workers, their families. It was allowed to fade away. Strong individualism came to the centre of thought. So many, we must recognise too, have paid such a high price for the failure to respond to the Brandt Report at global level, even as a first step or a partial solution. We need them as a matter of urgency to reflect and ask what kind of society we are willing to accept, what kind of global society we are striving for, and which are the arrangements and compromises we will seek and accept to realise such a kind of society. Eradicating poverty, achieving food security, ending the scandalous inequalities that exist. These are the goals which will protect our planet and ensure our future. But it is not easy. We live with our contradictions. Howard Stein of the University of Michigan in a recent paper in Ireland offered us a frightening example of such contradictions by which we as a global community live. The ethical contradictions, for example, that arise when we express a concern for the elimination of murdered hunger, and that is admirable. Yet at the same time, we allow speculation and food to, to flourish. In 2011, it is estimated that 61% of wheat futures, the wheat futures market, was held by speculators, compared to 12% in the mid-90s prior to deregulation. That, those are the kind of examples Professor Stein offered us. So economics, I suggest, must be returned to an ethical and cultural context. And in South America, there are those who are writing of some. Brazilian economist Marcos Ayuda is succinct in his description of the challenge that faces us now as a global community. In today's world, he writes, nearly 90% of global consumption belongs to the richest 20%. Without reducing excess consumption and planning economic growth on behalf of those in need, and there is no solution to the social and environmental crisis. Without sharing wealth, knowledge and power, humankind will not survive. 
Only a new consciousness and a new development paradigm will respond to this challenge. As you have shown in Latin America, in a number of significant cases, and they differ, there is indeed another way. And yes, we can have growth of a sustainable kind and reduce poverty and inequality. As Ms. Alicia Barquena, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, noted at a meeting of the Commission in New York in March, regional growth remains above global economic growth and is expected to be at 3.7% this year. But this growth is not at the exclusion of poverty reduction. And yes, there is so much more to be done. But perhaps one of the most significant aspects of Ms. Barsena's report was that the extremely high poverty rate of 48.8% in 1990 has fallen to 304 in 2011. Still scandalously high, but a real achievement. It is also noteworthy that this region, even if so much remains to be done, as I have said, has made substantial gains in reducing inequality. Significantly in Argentina, the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, Brazil, Chile, El Salvador, Mexico, and the plurinational state of Bolivia. These important achievements are all the more striking against the background of the recent global economic crisis. Beyond that, they affirm the now proven and incontestable fact that more equal societies are healthier societies. Finally, I believe that the relationship between the European Union and your region must work to recognize and strengthen these achievements and address social and human dimensions as well as promoting growth. I believe we can achieve interdependencies and meaningful connections which have both economic and social benefits. One form of these interdependencies may indeed be trade, but there are other rich avenues of cooperation in the exchange of models of intellectual work. The new accord between the European Union and Colombia and Peru creates possibilities, may offer a promise in its structure. Trade in both economies will probably increase by 6% in the medium term, leading to a direct and positive impact for manufacturers and agricultural producers. But the human rights guarantees and their transparency and delivery and vindication are a crucial context for such progress. They constitute a litmus test for such agreements. The agreement does indeed set out the core labor standards to be abided, as contained in the ILO fundamental conventions, as well as eight key environmental conventions. Very importantly, the proposed agreement establishes an obligation of transparency, coupled with mechanisms of consultation of and engagement with civil society organizations in its implementation. It is essential that we establish parity of steam for environmental law and labor law in comparison to international trade agreements. There are also, of course, the rights of indigenous groups, not only their re recognition, but their vindication, rights not only of protection based on the past, but also as owners of resources and intellectual property that are valuable for all of humankind and into the future. And as to institutional development, if there is anything we have learned in Europe from the current economic crisis, it is that citizens trust, not only in government and its agencies, but also in so many professions of the private sector, and its institutions, has been shattered. Regaining this trust requires a new accountable model of economy, which serves society and its citizens, one that is ethical and characterized by human values and respect for the dignity of the human person and communities. And as to democratic participation, it is only by centrally engaging citizens in policy development will that trust be regained. It will call for a genuinely participative society and decision-making structures. And again in Latin America we've seen real increases in participation and new forms of consultation and innovations such as plebiscite democracy, which constitute valuable models, I believe, for us all, including those of us in Europe and solidarity, and the unquenchable spirit of humanity, which is so important. I conclude my words with a brief reflection on a triumphant day for Chile, and indeed the world in recent years, which we in Ireland shared with Chile and the whole world. In 2010, over one billion people across the globe 
watched as the last of 33 miners emerged, unharmed after being trapped 700 metres underground for 69 days. During their 69-day entrapment, the miners demonstrated an extraordinary power in holding on to hope and the value of perseverance in overcoming what might present itself as an unsurmountable challenge. In addition, the solidarity and steadfastness of the miners' families, friends and communities across the world was remarkable. But the solidarity went beyond a shared hope for a positive outcome and for the men's safety. What occurred was multinational cooperation with a common purpose. The rescue effort included the deployment of three large international drilling rig teams, nearly every government ministry, the expertise of NASA from the US, and more than a dozen multinational corporations. corporations. The skills, the experience and expertise of drilling companies, health and safety experts, project managers, medical experts from across the world, combined to bring the miners home safely. As president of Ireland, Uchtaran Ahem, I'm so pleased that it was an Irish company called Mincom, based in the west of Ireland, which produced the reverse circulation drill that drilled through almost two and a half thousand feet of rock, which allowed the rescue official to gain access to the trap miners. All of us in Ireland were proud that we could contribute, and we were humbled to have been part of this global effort. Estos hombres y sus comunidades Su resolución en caso de desastre y la respuesta de las labores multinacionales de rescate lustran los principios y modelos de trabajo que nos pueden ayudar a atravesar la actual crisis económica mundial si somos lo suficientemente valientes como para involucrarnos. Como surgirá de nos hacer frente a la crisis económica con el mismo tipo de creatividad, rigor intelectual, la misma esperanza y perseverancia y el mismo tipo de cooperación global con el propósito común de un desarrollo sostenible y cultivo con dignidad. Nuestras dos regiones en conjunto tienen la posibilidad de alcanzar tanto, de poner un gran ejemplo en su lugar en un momento crucial para la humanidad. Garamila Mahaki, muchas gracias.